Hello everybody, uh, Chip Paul here with Jed Green. Very honored to have Jed with me today. So we're going to do something really fun. So today is the anniversary of the passage of Oklahoma's medical marijuana law. And this was uh, unprecedented, let's say, around the country. Oklahoma is the reddest of the red states. Um, and, you know, passing a medical marijuana law in Oklahoma took a trick. And there was a lot of people who um, we want to talk about today. But what Jen and I really wanted to do was lay down the history of this movement. It, there's all kinds of people that want to change this history or alter this history, but we lived it and we know it better than anybody else. And so we're in a good position to talk about it and kind of lay it down. Um, but Jed, it's an honor to have you here today. I'm excited to do this with you. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you, you know, having me, uh, having me pop on. I mean, it's a, definitely a historical day for, uh, you know, I believe not just for folks here in Oklahoma, but uh, for folks nationwide, you know, state question 788. Um, which uh, you know was an initiative petition. bunch of bunch of folks, yourself, others, after uh, many attempts, were able to get enough signatures to get it on the ballot. And um, the the really impactful thing is is that the program itself was so different from the get go. Having seen what wasn't working and what wasn't providing access in other states, you know. Uh, uh, it's something that kicked it off and it ran, you know, it ran pretty wide open. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, it uh, it had it had a, it had a, a broader impact outside of Oklahoma. <laughs> we'll say we'll say that we'll say that. Well, and one of the things that you you just said, and, and it, this really what you know, I talk about this, and people think, oh yeah, whatever, Chip, you're just you know spewing stuff, but the. 2014 petition that we ran, and, and again, we're going to talk about all this history, we're going to talk about all the people that, that have participated in all this, but the 2014 petition that we ran looked a lot like Colorado's law, and I mean, sorry, California's law, and the difference between 2014 and 2016 was dramatic, but that was all lessons learned, that was all like, gosh, it, you know, Illinois really screwed this up, and you know, well, Florida almost got their thing done, and kind of what held them back, but what did people do around the country that really screwed up medical marijuana laws? And so this is how we got the no medical conditions and the really we're not going to restrict commercial licenses. Uh, why would we do that? That just restricts the market. And, right. right. And, 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 and the enactment clause, you know, this goes into effect in 60 days and the <laughs> newly formed authority has two weeks to approve licenses. If someone said that the Capitol wants, we dropped the hammer. <laughs> you know? So, um, but that was the thing, you know, it's like when you watch, you know, say uh, something going into effect in Maine and 10 years later, there's still nothing because of the stall, you know, we, you know. Does Arkansas have a program yet? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, we, yeah, there's, uh, so, but it definitely, it definitely had a, a broad effect. And again, you know, first state, no limiting you know, and really open it up, and uh, uh, you know, of course, we caught a lot of a lot of grief from the establishment uh, on the deal that you know this was just recreational in disguise, you know, and, and to, well, no, it does take a doctor's recommendation, and and I pose that still today that the difference between medical and recreational use of any natural medicine or drug is the intent of the user. Absolutely. That's yeah. it. it. You know, so you ask people, why do you recreationally use marijuana? Oh, well, I like to come home at night and relax. Well, that's a medical reason. Oh, well, I like to just, you know, kind of check out. That's a medical reason. Oh, well, it, you know, helps me think better. That's a medical reason. So it's, you know, it's very hard to find a real true recreational user. Uh, right. It, it really is. Yeah. It really is. I mean, until you, you know, get to the point of, uh, let's, uh, let's load up the leaf blowers and fog the room out for the hell of it. I mean, at that point, you're having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> we had to keep some people from doing that for <laughs> Well, and I believe that people should have the right to leave blowers, so, but we're not there now, guys. <laughs> but funny story, right after we passed the law, and this person will know who they are, but it, uh, we had a, had a uh, it might have been a canvas cup or something, it was right after we passed the law, and so it was, you know, everybody was all excited, and so everybody was doing crazy things, but we had a, a major corporation CEO out with a leaf blower <laughs> blowing marijuana smoke to everybody. And I got him, got him on the phone and I said, it's not a good look. Let's calm that down. Why 
attorney says it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> my attorney says it's all right. Yeah. yeah, without diving down that rabbit hole in Oklahoma cannabis history, my attorney says it's all right. Okay, <laughs> that may still not be the uh, best thing that you've got going on right now. But what, what Jen and I wanted to do for you guys is kind of walk you through the history. So this may be, there's going to be some funny moments in here. There's some tragic moments. There's some, oh my, really that happened kind of moments uh, that we'll walk you guys through. But uh, we really want to kind of walk you through everybody that, that kind of made this happen, everybody that participated. There's people that don't get a lot of credit, like Mike Pearson, you know, would be one. And um, Mike, uh, Mike was one of the first people to really stand up in Oklahoma and say, you know, we need medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. Do you want to kind of talk a little bit about Mike? And yeah, yeah, that's a, that's the thing is that, uh, um, you know, it's really, it's a really, really interesting history, the marijuana and uh, it really, uh, it really did kind of kick off with uh, a gentleman, Mike Pearson, back in uh, around around 1990. Now, of course, you know Mike's still around. He's uh, he's retired. Hey, Mike. But uh, yeah, Mike, <laughs> shout out, love you, brother. Um, but what what? And, and I was talking with Mike yesterday. Oh, you know, perfect. I was talking with Mike yesterday, and because uh, I like to, you know, we're talking 35 years of history here, folks, and we like to, you know, make sure that we're kind of getting it in the right direction, right? Um, so, but I was talking to Mike yesterday, and it's it's an interesting story. So how did Mike, you know, get get going with this? So in uh, in around 1990, mm -hmm. around 1990, um, Mike uh, uh, was watching a address by uh, 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 Bush the 41st, you know, HW, you yep. know? Okay. And so at the time, um, uh, Bush was saying, well, you know, we're going to, I'm willing to work. It was some speech about something, I can't remember exactly, but to paraphrase the thing is, I'll work with everyone except for these damn druggies. <laughs> and that, I guess that set Mike off and he said, well, no, uh, we're not, we're not for your deal. So he, um, uh, so at that point is when he worked to form the Oklahoma chapter of normal. Okay. And kind of really took off from there. So uh, uh, Mike's a real inspiration because again, guys, this is, you know, this is 1990 Oklahoma. You know, you would get, if you wore a shirt with a marijuana leaf on it, you were getting stopped and frisked. Yeah, yeah. Like absolutely. you were, it, it was not, it was not good. I mean, we're talking about a state where, you know, cultivation was 99 years per plant. Yeah. You know, having marijuana was a life sentence. Having a seed would send you to jail for 10 years yep. here in Oklahoma. So oppression is an understatement, right? So the most draconian laws in the nation, of course, that's where we were at with it. So yep. Mike gets going in 1990 and I mean, just goes right for the gut, um, started uh, doing a lot of lobbying at the Capitol. And by 1994, um, he managed to get the first uh, medical marijuana bill. Now, now that's pretty amazing because I think I think the first medical marijuana New Mexico I think is the first medical marijuana program. I think that was ninety six. Either them or California. I can't remember Cal who got out of the gate first. California time. did better than New Mexico, but I think honestly, I think New Mexico was the first. But yeah, it's what it's yeah, kind of, but it's so around that range. But he's yeah. earlier than those programs. Yeah, I mean, this was, uh, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, the national organization, you know, normal yeah. existing out of California was there doing things and working up to those propositions. But what's interesting is that, yeah, there was a very, you know, kind of similar track of when we started seeing this type of legislation pop up. Now, yeah. of course, being Oklahoma, it was actually amazing that someone was willing to run a medical marijuana bill. <laughs> yeah, and that was a guy, uh, a guy, uh, Jeff Hamilton, uh, representative from uh, the south side of okay. Oklahoma City. So that area just south of I-40, uh, House District uh, uh, 89 or 90. I can't remember which one it was. It was six. But okay. Anyway, um, Anyway, so he runs it. It didn't get a committee hearing, even though his party was in power at the time. It was just something that folks were like, whoa, you know, 
let's back off of this. I wonder, I wonder if Danny Hilliard was the uh, floor leader at the time. So I'm, I know Danny, so I'm gonna have to yeah. call him and ask him if he he's the one that kept that off the floor. So, yeah. So this uh so um so so yeah so uh, so Mike ran that. And I mean a lot of intensive efforts at it and. Um, anyway, so, uh, in his time there, uh, uh, he told me that, um, he told me that the, uh, uh, that it occurred to him to run for office. And so he actually wound up running a couple of times for state representative, almost beat a 24 year incumbent. This is oh, before wow. term limits, oh, wow. uh, in the, in the good old boy zone of Logan County. Um, so back, in, back in the 90s. Uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, Uncle Gene was from down in the palace. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so anyway, he did that and then actually wound up uh, uh, becoming county commissioner up there yeah. in Logan County for a time. And so, um, you know, one other interesting story, I, you know, I've got to get together with Mike and really, you know, get him to tell some of these stories, right? But one thing he pointed out to me, this was really interesting, was that um, the uh, the impetus for the D.A.R.E. program mm -hmm. and uh, the Just Say No campaign of the mid-80s was sparked by a movie. Oh, really? Nine to five. <laughs> interesting. Nine to five <laughs> was the impetus, and, and, and we'll get this, we'll get this and really get this good story. I'm going to, but just kind of an overview basically about what happened was that, uh, in nine to five, what happens is all the gals in the office, you know, got, you know, got the a-hole boss and they were all having a bad time. They all got together and they decided to smoke a joint. <laughs> and so they smoked a joint, they relaxed, they chilled, they come up with a master plan. And then there's the next part of the movie. Yeah. And so, um, at that time, um, uh, at that time, at the premiere, some of the, uh, some various government officials, you know, were there. Uh, I think, because uh, uh, remember, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan was tied into Hollywood. Oh, you yeah. know, and so Nancy Reagan, you know, so 950, oh, here's this, you know, so they see it and they come out of it and they're like, we got to do something. They just made weed look really, really good. Yeah. And so that actually touched off the D.A.R.E. program <laughs> and the Just Say No program, which of course, that sort of, you know, animosity led, you know, several years later to Bush making the comment that, you know, inspired, you know, like we're just a bunch of dirties out here, you yeah. know, that inspired the movement to start in Oklahoma. So just really, really interesting. Cool stuff, yeah. And then, so Mike, Mike meets Norma Sapp at some point, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and, and he told me that uh, that he ran into her at something called uh, the Peace Fest in Oklahoma City. <laughs> and uh, what it is, there's a guy, uh, there's a guy, and what's really, really interesting is a lot of folks here are rooted, uh, Mike was living in Paseo at the time, in okay. Oklahoma City. Okay. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, Nathaniel Batchelter, he did, uh, ran a, a thing called the Peace House. Yeah. And so, it was awesome. well, and this is the thing is that this it's is so where, awesome. well, and I, I personally love it because you know, the, that, that West side of Oklahoma city, yeah. that's where I'm from. Okay. You know, so, and, and again, that area of Oklahoma city is the greenest by voting. We were 85% pro 788. Oh wow. Like it's a green zone down there. And oh, so wow. it's really cool that a lot of historically that a lot of folks have come from that part of town that have been pushing the ball. So yep. anyway, um, uh, so, uh, so meets Norma at a, at a peace fest that the peace house used to do down at the civic center, okay. uh, downtown. It was kind of a small deal, but they ran into each other there. And then as Mike goes into, um, Mike goes into public office. Yeah. Uh, you know, Norma, you know, takes the reins. And kind of takes everything Norma, out. Right. And so now we're getting into like this. Uh, um, and I think I posted yesterday, uh, uh, you know, Mike was still active in, uh, uh, I don't want to skip over this. And in 99, they had a, uh, uh, an event over at Will Rogers Park on 36th and Portland. Again, okay. over in the west side, yeah. right? Yeah. And so had that. Um, and uh, I actually put a flyer out. Yesterday, I think I shared a flyer yesterday. It was Hemp Fest '99 because we weren't going to call it marijuana; we were going to call it hemp. You know, Mike also ran the Hemporium 
down at the flea market on about uh, 10th and Penn okay. for about 10 years. Okay. And this was the place that, you know, Oklahoma City, you could go and, you know, get your hemp goods and, you know, it's flea market. So yeah. hemp necklaces and all of that. So, I mean, Mike wasn't just, you know, doing some stuff. I mean, he was all in on this to the point where, you know, he was willing to set up openly represent this, which, which it takes a lot of sand. A man. lot of sand because it, so remember the Norman uh, hemp shop Gentleman, I'll remember his name in a second, but it skips my mind right now. But the, he got busted in like on the paraphernalia. Friendly Market. Friendly Market. Yep. Yep. And so Friendly Market, and I'm sorry I can't remember your name right now, but I'll remember it. But he was instrumental in that he pushed that he took that lawsuit. He took the city of Norman to the mat on uh-huh. that lawsuit. But again, all he was doing, he had um, hemp type paraphernalia and they shut him down they shut his business down they shut everything so that was part of kind of that was beginning to where i started paying attention and kind of watching things and seeing things but it it was draconian in oklahoma so for somebody to do what mike was doing in 1999 yeah yeah and and that's the and that's the thing is that you know like again like the friendly market case one of the things that that established in the concept of drug paraphernalia is that uh, you know it used to be we need a water pipe for smoking tobacco, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. but but what friendly market uh, case really um, uh, really laid forth was that the defining line kind of on if something is or is not drug paraphernalia is is there active residue in the in yeah. the actual you know the physical unit. object in the unit or yeah. the pipe you know obviously papers don't count because they're gone, you know, but you know, yeah. you know, that type of a deal. So that was interesting, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, but for, for me, like I started, so the big thing for me when I really started paying attention was Nor- when Norma did that sooner poll, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of 2013 and, um, and I know Norma had been really active, um, you know, in normal, I know that, you know, as she talks about it, she had been working with the legislature and felt like she was making traction. But that poll, that 2013 poll, that, and you said 57%, which yeah, I yeah. can't remember what it was, but. Well, and that's the thing is that there was, uh, um, you know, Norma, you know, so, you know, some coming into the 2000s, you know, uh, Norma, uh, I think in a lot of, you know, it, it, it's really kind of underappreciated, you know, what Norma did to kind of carry yeah, things through in those, you know, in those early 2000s, mid 2000s. I mean, stayed active, stayed on folks at the Capitol, you know, but it was a. Uh, uh, Norma likely had an office at the Capitol. She was up there that much. Yeah. 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 She was up there every single day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so then the poll. Yeah. You know, the poll. And so um, when uh, uh, so I talked to Norma for a little bit yesterday and talked about the poll. Okay. And so what had a, what had occurred um, is uh, there is a, a local polling outfit, Sooner Poll, it's run by a guy named Bill Shepard. Great. And guy. yeah, great. Love guy. You, Bill. And he's been around for a long time. Footnote: Bill took a lot of unnecessary shit. Over on eight twenty, on, on and yep. you know we can talk about that later, but you know that that he didn't, he, you know. Anyway, yep. so Bill reaches out to Norma and says, "Hey Norma, I'm running a poll and I've got room for a few extra questions." And you know, for that's kind of how polls were built. You'll have multiple questions. You may have one interest group that really only wants three questions, or another group that only wants a couple of questions, and so you can kind of cobble one together split the cost up. Yep. So Norma told me that uh, Bill reached out and said, hey, I've got room for questions in this poll. Um, and I therefore, I mean, instead of having to, uh, this being a, you know, like a seven to 10 K poll at the time, you can throw a couple of questions in here and get that done for 2,500 bucks. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, so Norma ran around, cobbled together the, the checks. I think one person may have thrown in a thousand bucks, um, but generally otherwise it's kind of 50 here, hundred there, you know, grassroots deal. Yep. Paid for the poll. Poll comes back and the poll said that medical marijuana was 57% popular in Oklahoma. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, so that poll and that poll, that poll, just as, you know, I'm a business person at this time. I'm, you know, this was 2013 yeah. to 2014. I, 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 like, I didn't really 
you know, Cindy and I had just tried medical marijuana for what was going on with us. It worked for us, so we knew that it was kind of medi a medical thing, so we were paying attention. But that blew me away. That that poll, when that poll came out, that really, that said something to me. That, that, go ahead. Well, it really did. It kind of tells you, you know, it kind of tells you what a lot of folks already knew. Yeah. You know, I mean, I myself, I'm someone that, you know, had uh, been in the uh, in the legacy here in Oklahoma since the <laughs> late 80s, <laughs> you know, and um, so, but it, it's kind of one of those things, it's, it's one thing that we always knew, you know, in the 80s, 90s, you know, 2000s, it, we'd look at each other and be like, everyone out here is smoking weed. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, obviously we were kind of in a bowl in, you know, that part of Oklahoma City, but it was relevant. I mean, we knew about all the ops going, you know, all the grows going on around the state as, you know, uh, Pearson was telling me that there was a time where the entire north bank of the Cimarron River from I-35 east was just, just, I mean, it had so much growing out there. Yeah, the, 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 uh, yeah, the, uh, um, that the, that the marshals couldn't even clean it all up and they just gave up, you know? So, um, so, uh, 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 yeah, but it, d d d d so it was surprising and it was surprising to me and that that many people, and we just had, you know, Colorado was getting ready to mm -hmm. ask their, you know, adult use question. Um, so we had marijuana in the news, but it just shocked me that there was that many Oklahomans. Yeah. I mean, and, it, and it's one of those, and it's really, it's really interesting. What, what, what was really interesting to me was that 57% of Oklahomans would even admit that they were for it. I mean, again, the, the stigma, the persecution was real. So, yeah. so okay, so the poll comes out, right? Yeah. And, you know, you guys are dialing in. Um, uh, other folks around, Isaac Cabinets. Yeah. You know, uh, organization, startup organization, Green the Vote. Yeah. Uh, uh, Isaac, uh, uh, Isaac, actually was honored on the house floor with a humanitarian award for his efforts to yeah, you know really do cool. legalization yeah. and that's cool we posted that uh, uh we posted that video on uh, over on our facebook page but yeah. so what we start to see now is a you know in a, you know in the tw early 20 teens you know we start to see that push and we yeah. start to see uh, efforts to get this on the ballot, and that's where you uh, really came in and started to, you know, and, and started pushing the ball forward. And you and Cindy started putting a lot into this. So, I mean, tell us about that because yeah. now we're into that phase where you know your your efforts are very very central. So yeah, so good. And uh, so basically, we saw that poll that Norman did, you know. Uh -huh. So and that that meant a lot. It's like wow, fifty seven percent of Oklahomans will support a medical marijuana program. That shocked me. But then the second kind of kicker was when Connie, Connie Johnson, she was a state senator mm -hmm. at the time. So Connie had a, uh, and Connie was a, uh, she's a senator from Inner Oklahoma City. Um, and she was always supportive of marijuana, but she had a rally and kind of after that survey came out, you know, everybody's like, wow. So she had a rally at the state capitol. I think they got 2000 people and this mm -hmm. was January, March, 2014. So Cindy and I were sitting around and, and, and talking and thought, well, I wonder if Oklahoma would support a medical marijuana law, a medical marijuana petition effort. I wonder if we could get something like that started. So we started asking around, and so Porter Davis, mm -hmm. um, who Porter Davis was a longtime uh, political pundit. He died not too long ago. He was a great guy, but Porter, Porter was one of the first guys that we talked to. Porter said, great idea. I want to come to the meeting, you know, formation meeting. I'll be there. Um, we talked to a guy who had run, uh, he was just coming off the Occupy Tulsa movement. Yeah. Uh, a guy yeah. named Frank Grove. Yeah, Frank. So we talked to Frank. We said, Frank, you know, do you want to kind of come to this organizational meeting? And, you know, we're trying to put together this group. So Frank was all in. And then a lady named Lisa Bauer. And Lisa had um, an organization. I can't remember the name of the organization now, but she was head of a pretty good group in Oklahoma that was, it was parental rights and kind of our ability to sustain ourselves with food and things like that. I'll mm -hmm. think of that in the organization in a minute. Anyway, she was kind of representing that organization. 
So we have this meeting, there's five of us, and so we're all sitting around talking, and we're hashing it out, should we do this, should we not, you know, if we're going to do this, we're going to have to get something out by May, do we even have time to do it, and to, you know, so let's take a vote, so we all looked around, and we, you know, raised our hands, so Cindy and I and Frank Grove said, yeah, we're ready to do this, and Porter is out, and Lisa Bauer, out, you know, but they'll certainly be helpful, but they mm -hmm. didn't think we had, to, had time or anything, so we decided to do this. But one of the first things you do, okay, well, so what petition are we going to run? Because, again, you have to put together what you think is going to be the anticipated law. And so we didn't want to make mistakes. We didn't want to screw that up. And so start picking up the phone and, well, you know, who's a constitutional attorney who we can talk to about the home has ever written one of these things? So that was really, we couldn't find anybody. We ended up taking California's law. Mm -hmm and modifying it quite a bit, um, but it would have been, that first petition would have looked a lot like what California had at the time. Um, we would have had medical conditions. Um, there would have been a way to get a card with kind of a pain, you know, so you kind of have pain out to be able to get a card, but we would have had medical conditions. So, you know, and again, I, I you know, put that one together too. That one was horrible, so thank God mm -hmm. we didn't pass that. But that was what, so we started, and it was shocking when we kicked everything off. We never got, we were in Tulsa. We had Tulsa really well organized, but we did not have Oklahoma City well organized. We didn't have the western part of the state organized. The south was kind of organized, but we were using, let's say, um, you know, the Occupy network, if you mm -hmm. will, the kind of the real extreme left network to organize everybody. Mm -hmm. And that kind of worked, but it didn't work as good as what we kind of did in 2016. Um, Isaac showed up really interestingly. We were So we were unsuccessful in that effort, but we were... And this was the 2014, 2014 effort. effort? Right, yeah. right. And one and one thing, uh, 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 one thing here, Dee, uh, you had mentioned that... Uh, that Connie, Senator Johnson at yeah, the time, yeah. you know, had had this rally, and that was surrounding, um, and that was surrounding a bill that she filed, right, and started pushing. And like you said, all of a sudden, you know, historically, a lot of things that Mike did or Norma did, you know, you'd be doing good if you got 30, 40 people show up and be willing to say, "Hey, we support this," and risk getting pulled over when they left. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that was. Uh, There's uh, pictures. Of so that was. Rallies that we did, mm -hmm. and this was during the petition at the Capitol. And there's you know 200 people there, and that was a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Time. So it was really kind of a breakthrough moment that uh, uh, that Connie was able to inspire there in 2014. So the 2014 petition effort was uh, was unsuccessful. Yeah. Um, and so what happened then? So 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 we knew that we were we knew that we had got we knew that we could get it. If mm -hmm. we had proper planning, so it's we were shocked at let's say how successful the 2014 effort was, even in its unsuccess. Mm -hmm. So we got more signatures, and we thought we got over we got more signatures in 2014 than we got in 2016. Yeah, you were just the the deal was 2014 would have been a constitutional right. amendment, and so the signature bar was higher. Yeah. than what it was, but you actually, I mean, about how many signatures did you get? In about 100,000. About 100,000. Yeah, yeah. So 40, that, you know, 30,000, let's say, more than we got in 2016, Yeah, which is a big deal, right? And so everybody was aware of that effort in 2014. Everybody kind of, you know, wanted to sign the petitions and all that. We made a lot of mistakes. We weren't well organized. We, we had it written as a constitutional, which we didn't want at the time because nobody knows what they're doing here yet still, although we're getting a better idea. Um, but all that happened. So we knew that we were going to petition again. We absolutely knew that the same group. And to Cindy and I, again, this I was a business person. This was not something that I really wanted mm -hmm. to focus on. So I had a business, a successful business. I did not want to get sucked into this effort. But I agreed, you know, okay, we'll, we'll do it again. I mean, we need to do yeah. it again because we likely will get it. And, and we were going to petition again in 2015, but we decided not to. And that's when uh, Green the Vote really showed up. So we had a lot of our supporters and stuff that said, hey, if we're, we want to petition again in 2015, we think we can get this. So Isaac kind of popped up, and he led that whole effort. Yeah, so Isaac you know, yeah. kind of took, that, took that, to that lead on the next effort yeah. in 2015 and that next stab at it. So, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so and so they kind of they ran that petition over. It wasn't the best time to petition, you know. And so it's they 
they they made a lot of mistakes too, like we did. But it, they basically petitioned over the Christmas holiday, which was kind of a bad. You know, it's not really the best time. Tough to time. Yeah. Tough time. But they still kept the activity alive. And so when we decided to petition again in 2016, and we had our act together better, um, we had Joe Dorman had just run for governor as uh -huh. a Democrat, yep. and he got beat by Mary Fallon, who mm -hmm. was the incumbent. But Joe was well known, and Joe was a big advocate for marijuana. And so Joe joined our board, which really um, helped us. We thought it was really going to help us with fundraising and everything. It really it didn't really matter that much. But Joe brought some resources that he had call centers and things like that that really mm -hmm. helped us a lot. So Joe joined our board. But the, almost my whole role in 2016 was keeping Frank and Joe from, from killing each other. <laughs> but you know that whole 2016 thing. I, to Frank's credit, it, it, we were not. We were daily um, counting signatures, so we knew right where we were at at any given time in that whole. Right. Hour. And we knew we were behind the whole time, and mm -hmm. this is the way petitioning efforts go. And so, but we were kind of barely behind. Frank decided to go take this whole tent city to Oklahoma City. And again, we really never got Oklahoma City well organized. Mm -hmm. but this helped a lot. And so he camped out, you know, as you know, in the tent city for a month and a half and really brought in a ton of signatures that helped drag us over the line. Yeah, yeah. And that's and so that's the thing, you know, we're seeing um, you know, we're seeing here where now by mid twenty teens that there is just repetitive effort on this. I mean, there were even a couple of, you know, non-serious per se efforts that were filed in there. I mean, I yeah. think that uh, when I ran through it, I think that uh, State Question 788 in 2016 was literally like the seventh attempt. Yeah, yeah. Of, of if you just go by filings, you know, you yeah. got some serious attempts, but so, yeah, so that's a... Uh, uh, yeah, let's talk, let's let's talk about that a little bit more in uh, in, in in 2016, right? So, um, so I'm you know I'm here in Oklahoma City, yeah, and I start seeing. Let's see, they had a, a, a spot was set up over right uh, again over in my you know in my in my hood over on uh, about 28th and Penn. There's a uh, a, a grow supply store. I can't remember the folks' name, but a, a, a grow store over there that was selling. You know, just organic stuff, you know, this stuff. It was the quasi, yeah, we're here, but you can get your grow crap for, you know. Anyway. Yeah. So, um, I don't remember. Hydroponic tomatoes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Hydroponic so tomatoes. tomatoes. That's what we're doing here. Yes. Um, so, anyway, but, so I remember seeing that, and, but then there was Fort Canna. And that. <laughs> Fort Canna. Fort Canna. Yeah. And so, what, what, what where, you, where you described this at was, uh, this was over, uh, folks from Oklahoma City, so this was over on Meridian and Northwest Expressway, okay? There is a lock there where a bunch of y'all old schoolers remember was where the uh, Lake Hefner bait shop was back in like the 60s, <laughs> 70s, and 80s, right? So this is where the bait shop was. You'd go get minnows and stuff to go fishing over at Lake Hefner. Yeah. Anyway, that's no longer there. But there's an area there, and so uh, and 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 so Frank, bro, Frank, uh, you know, if you happen to catch this man, cannot tell you how much I appreciate your efforts because what folks need to understand is that we have the pro fundamentally we have the program that we have today because of passion. Yeah, thousand percent pure passion, and Frank probably embodies that as much as anyone. Yep. Um, again. Uh, he went and established Fort Canna on the side of Northwest Expressway and posted up there for at least a month. And, you know, a lot of folks, you know, uh, 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 Chelsea, Nikki, you know, some of the folks from here in Oklahoma City, yep. uh, you know, they're telling me stories about bringing bags of burgers in from Brahms. I mean, this was a shoestring affair. Like, Frank is sitting on the side of Northwest Expressway fighting an all-out war of attrition to <laughs> yeah. get these signatures. And so, um, uh, and, and of course the cops, I mean, even in uh, 2016, they, you know, the cops came oh. out and were sweating them. And I mean, it's it, a, it, we had to make a decision whether or not to file, file a federal lawsuit against the city of Tulsa because of the harassment of the police. And we decided not there. to do that. Yeah, yeah but it, again, we had police issues. Every, and Frank was constantly... 
he finally it kind of just found common ground with the beat cops that were patrolling yeah. that area. And they were yeah. like, finally left them alone. But they, they they finally realized that you know again just dedication, sheer force of will. Yeah. You know, and, and being, <laughs> right, and being able to, you know, literally, literally, you know, be ready to take a beat down over. Yeah, yeah. You know? But that but that really dragged us over um it, it, it I'll tell you a funny story. We're we're um last couple of days of the petitioning effort and it's looking like we're gonna be about a thousand signatures short. And again, mm-hmm. we're counting signatures, maybe even five hundred signatures short. But we're all pretty convinced that we're gonna be short. And in a way it's kind of a relief. Um, cause it's been three years of hell, you know, to, to even do this. And so right. now maybe somebody else can pick up the ball and, you know, take it and probably do better than we were doing with it. Um, but in a way, you know, it's disappointing. We worked so hard for it. And somehow on that last day, we got in enough signatures to not only get over the line, but get over the line almost by a thousand, um, which... I don't know how no one challenged us. I really still don't know how no one challenged us. But, um, you know, we, we made it. So we made it barely. And, you know, it, it stuck to Cindy and I like to glue it is. So, yeah. And you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, that's, yeah, that was, uh, uh, that was really interesting. Um, you know, some, uh, over the last few years, some of the, you know, post-mortem conversations that I've had with, uh, uh, you know, folks involved in, uh, in state government and such, is that, uh, and this is interesting, is that uh, th- this is where the trend kind of began uh, for uh, 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 the state coming back and trying to make the petition process harder. Yeah. Oh, you absolutely. Know, I mean, the, the, well, you know, elected officials don't like people exercising their power. And, uh, yeah, it's one of those things where if they, uh, uh, if, uh, if a entity had decided to challenge those signatures that, you know, likely they may have knocked it off the ballot, but, you know, uh, without, without going all off into it, you know, I, it's pretty safe to say that the folks that would have challenged it decided not to challenge it because they firmly believed that they would defeat it yeah. in the polls and running that campaign is a lot more lucrative than running a signature Signature. challenge. Yeah, you're right. That's interesting. I really thought about that. But you know, that when all that happened, we thought we were going to make the November ballot. So we thought we were going to be on the Trump 2016 presidential ballot Mm -hmm. um, and because we were done in August, right? So we were done in August. All of a sudden in August, we're like, yeah, baby, we're going to be on the ballot. We didn't get challenged through the signature count. We're going to be on the ballot. And the Supreme Court, you know, we got challenged on the ballot title. Right. right? <laughs> and this is such a great story. I love this story because A.G. Pruitt at the time, mm-hmm. who ended up becoming the Department Secretary of the Department of Interior, right, or Department of Energy, maybe? I think he ran the EPA. EPA, yeah, he ran the EPA. Right? He, he, he was sent to the EPA to dismantle the <laughs> EPA. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, 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 but Pruitt, he's a big states' rights guy. Right, uh-huh. so he's literally taken Oklahoma as an AG through all this states' rights stuff, all these states' rights cases, states' rights, states' rights, states' rights. Well, in order to keep this ballot title off of the 2016 ballot, he had to write an argument to the Oklahoma State Supreme Court. There was a very federalist argument mm-hmm. <laughs> about marijuana. So it's, you know, we didn't make the 2016 ballot, but it was kind of worth it just to know that Scott Pruitt had to well, and that's the thing is that when you talk about the petitions, the back end, so you know, the signatures weren't challenged, but the ballot title was. Yes. And so that's where he bogged down. It's also interesting to note that um, it's also interesting to note is that earlier, I believe it was right after Colorado uh, passed their law mm-hmm. that uh, uh, Pruitt led the charge uh, uh, filed suit Oklahoma versus Colorado to try to strike and Nebraska jumped in, you know, our, you know, trying to tell Colorado, trying to sue them to say that Colorado has to shut their program down. So big states rights over here, but I'm going to sue this state if I don't like what they're doing over here and got beat. Yeah, got beat. You know, thankfully. And so that actually, so we've got, there is a standing precedent that what one state does is their business. Right as opposed to anyone else. You know what I'm saying? Keep that, 
you know, so that, yeah. that, that, that there may yet still come back and be important and be important in the future, you yeah. know, but yeah, so, so he hung you up, didn't get on the ballot in 2016. So, um, it's one of the toughest things, uh, with, uh, initiative petitions because it's hurry up and wait. Yeah. Two There's years. a mass rush. Yeah. To, you know, to get after it, and then you'd have to sit there. And, I mean, when you're talking about political movements or any movement, I mean, you know, the, their hope was is you have momentum, you know, stall you out, keep you out of that ballot. You know, they were probably figured that you would have a better chance of passing it. Right. Then. And, you know, again, yeah. the political calculus, you know, they're like, oh, well, the general, presidential general, we don't want, you know, we don't want it on there. We don't know what's going to happen right yeah, yeah, and you, you know it was interesting too as we approached 2018. So 2017 was kind of a, you know, 2016 very exciting. You know, we didn't make the ballot, um, which was sad. But a lot there was we got a lot of press, let's say, out of that. You know, so we got a lot of um, media out of that where we weren't going to get screwed over. And that was my real, that was my fear, was that somehow they, they were going to take this away from us. They weren't going to let us vote on this. They were going to screw us over in some some way. So any time I could get me, national media attention, I was not trying to get yeah. national. But I got a lot of national media attention over that because it just, that was unfair. It wasn't right. And so I felt like we had some protection, you know, for the program. So the 2017 was pretty uneventful until the end of 2017. Now, you've got to think about, like, there was just one organization kind of doing this. A lot of people were helping. A lot of people were adding, let's say, to the support of this organization. But this organization was just the other organization that Cindy and I had called Oklahoma's for Health, in which Frank Grove was a major part of. But the fact that, you know, I'm a MAGA guy, right? So I'm a, you know, as soon as Trump got on that escalator, I wrote him a check. You know? mm -hmm. So it's, I'm that much of a MAGA guy. And Frank Grove is, again, he was the founding member of, of you know, uh, Underground, occupied Tulsa, he, right. you know, BLM, all that. So he's kind of the, we're extreme opposites politically, is mm -hmm. the point. But somehow we managed to not kill each other and keep the organization together and, you know, keep kind of rowing the boat in the same direction until the end of 2017. <laughs> right. And then that all kind of blew up. And, and so Frank really started another organization um, and uh, there was a, you know, kind of some bad blood, let's say, that happened during that time. But ultimately it didn't really matter because we're all, you know, kind of <coughs> going at this and we all want a yes vote. We're all going to be working for a yes vote anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but everything kind of got scattered to the four winds in the fall of 2017 and that's literally when you really became active and started really kind of getting everything together what you did through um your group really was instrumental in getting the election passed i think i don't think we would have had the success that we had in the election if it not weren't for everything that you guys were doing so do you want to kind of talk a little bit about 2017 early 2018 yeah yeah sure sure so um uh, you know, I've, uh, 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 I mean, you, you know well that, uh, that I've been, at that point in time, you know, I've done a lot of campaigns in Oklahoma, municipal to presidential level. You, you, did, know. The, you did the, so the most was successful at, Democratic presidential campaign likely in, the, in modern history, you ran. You ran Obama. Here, yeah, I was, I was Obama's state director here in 2008. Yeah. And, um, I mean, just a little bit about myself. I didn't even register to vote until I was 33. <laughs> I paid all the attention in the world. I was like, these guys are full of shit. I'm not getting involved in that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, uh, long personal story short, you know, I got involved. Uh, I got involved in campaigns and elections. Uh, 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 family historically Democrats, you know, union, you know, type, you know, blue collar worker, you know, yep. uh, blue collar worker, you know, the folks that would say vote for Obama and then voted for Trump. Yeah. You know, there's, there is a group in there. So that's kind of that, <laughs> that group, right? Um, now, uh, you know, it, but what I really, again, myself, I'm, I'm wholly independent, you know, and it's, uh, a truth. Bit, I know this over the years. Yeah. But See, this is, but this is the, this is the thing. So, uh, so, you know, like, so in, yeah, in, in 2008, I was Obama state director, ran a bunch of campaigns, but, 
you know, um, uh, by the time we got around to, and this is interesting, it's like you, interesting you mentioned Norman, right? Yeah. Uh, in 2014, he had, uh, um, uh, uh, in 2014, you know, he'd run for governor against Mary Fennell. Right, right, right. And one of the things, if you go back and look, and what, what I started doing, this is one of the things that I picked up from uh, Obama's effort, was it was, it was uh, uh, getting out the vote. Yeah. You know, what does it take to actually get the vote out? You know, and so uh, that's really what I keyed in on and did a lot of. We call it field operations, you know, and so was doing that. And, and, and he was more successful in getting out the vote, if I recall, than any of anyone else. Well, did. what happened straight up? What happened in 2014 was that I ran a, um, I ran a, I, I had, in, I ran a get out the vote campaign in Oklahoma County in 2014. That. Um, literally bumped turnout in Oklahoma County over what the entire rest of the state was by like five to seven percent. Oh, we turned wow. out. We turned out an extra twenty five thousand voters oh, that would not have normally showed up. You know, and so that's kind of what I did. So anyway, um, I'm you know I'm doing all that, and uh, you know I'd uh, you know been paying attention to what was going on in seven eighty eight, and then it was like in late twenty seventeen or early twenty eighteen that uh, Governor Fallon uh, declared that the vote was going to be held in the June 26th primary as opposed to the, you know, in the, as opposed to the general election yep. in 2018. And so uh, at that time, and again, you know, one of those folks that, you know, been, been involved with it here in Oklahoma for a long time, but I said, okay, I, I was like, okay, we've got a date on this. This thing's real now. Again, your fear you know, of 2017 subsided and then, okay, now we've got an election thing. Yeah. And so, um, I, uh, uh, so I was like, all right, let's get recon going and, uh, hopped in and kind of surveyed the field to see, okay, wh where did this come from? Who's where, you know, I know that Dorman had kind of been involved with it. Um, uh, saw, uh, what you had going with Oklahomans for health, saw what, uh, at that time Frank was doing with, uh, Oklahomans for cannabis. Yeah. And then, also noted that a guy that I'd known as a lobbyist for some left-leaning groups uh, like Sierra Club, Bud Scott, had decided to launch a, a trade association. Yeah. The first trade association, which unlike other states, this was actually good forethought on Bud's part, was to get a... Other states we had seen where the program had gone and then everything, you, know, you passed it, and then there's no organization at the capitals to actually keep the lawmakers on the rails, work with them, and so... It was one of the most, I think, foresighted uh, things ever. It still is a problem here in Oklahoma, and you and I can tell you in the weeds how that much of the, how it's a problem, not having a... And again, no offense to the trade organizations that are out there, but it just, you know, a, let's say... Uh, it was the right idea. It was no, 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 and, and that's that's the deal. Is right? It damn sure the right idea, yeah. you know. And and again, this is obviously it's a very dynamic. The industry itself, as it was created, is still. Again, if you want clarity, don't look to cannabis. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Unless it's for your personal health. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Business wise, there's no clarity here. Yeah. Um, anyway, so. Uh, so what I saw was, you know, I saw, you know, okay, so you had what you had going, you know, uh, uh, Frank had that group going, Bud was getting this group going, yeah. and, you know, one of the things that uh, that I've worked a lot with, with a lot of different communities, and by this time I'd worked with Democrats, Republicans, you know, I'd really established kind of my political position, I'm, I'm just going to be an independent entity, and we're going for common sense here, you know, if it's a... You know, if it's an issue I support, then I'm all in, right? So, uh, so what I saw, and this is where I was glad to be able to lean on that experience, was um, that it was obvious that what there were two things that were obvious to me. One, that the support was there. Mm -hmm. Two, I knew we had the votes. Yeah. Okay, I go back to my comment earlier. I'm like, man, everyone smokes around here. Yeah. Okay, you know it's there, but again, this is an underground. This is an entire community. There's, this is several hundred thousand people in a state that, 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 that underground. Right, that are, that are actively underground, okay? <laughs> so, 
Um, so what I saw was, and this is where I, I was, you know, grateful to be able to come in and lend my, my you know, experience, a couple of decades of experience to this, was that, you know, when you do these things, I knew that we had everything that we needed, but it was how to get it put together, and then also knowing what the opposition was going to do. Yeah. Because, you know, being involved in those wars on other issues, you know, they... The, the opposition that was going to form this, which is basically going to be your district attorneys, chamber of commerce. The light for light. The, Yeah, the establishment, <laughs> per se. Right, <laughs> right. Um, they were, uh, what they were going to do is that they were going to come in the last three to four weeks of the election, drop a million and a half, two million dollars on it, and just try to blow it out of the water with negative, all that type of stuff, right? So the, the thing to do, and that's what... Uh, in short, I did was to reach out to everyone. You know, I don't care who you are. You know, and what anyone says about you, what I care about is our relationship, right? Yeah. And so, um, was able to do that and was able to see where okay, this group needs this, this group needs this, and then kind of pass notes in between. You know, and it's really a lot of what we have even today. It's like what a lot of different industries or different groups have. Like teachers yeah. have got like five different groups representing them. So the, the trick was for the campaign was to, okay, you got folks who've done a lot of work together. They've got a lot of history. They're you know currently fractionalized a little bit. How do we bring that back together and coalesce all of that, make it work, yeah. and then get out ahead on the ground of the attacks that we know that are coming, shore this up and get ready to go and get that, get out the vote machine ready uh, for the last week. And I mean, by and large, that's what we did. That was amazing. And it, you know, you had some, uh, you guys, uh, and again, I, I, we didn't run campaigns. That's not what kind of what we did. It was you guys really ran the campaign and were the successful, let's say, uh, you know, you were successful in getting the yes vote. That was not Oklahoma's for health. We did a good job of getting it there, but you guys really ran that whole campaign. And it, a couple of things stand out in that campaign. And again, it, you know, we were all, everyone was doing what they could uh, to drag that across the line. But the Langford letter, so, so the, the, the couple of things I want to ask you about. The Langford letters, one, were you surprised at the softball of the advertising with all the reefer madness, it just kind of made it easy for us. There, the nose advertising really kind of worked in our favor, mm -hmm. I thought. Um, so those two things mainly. So the Langford letter, I thought, was just masterful in how that was answered, and that, you know, that created the probably five thousand vote swing. Yeah. It, so yeah. So mechanically, a couple of different things. So it was obvious that we were going to get heavily outspent. Yeah. But that our strength was the people. Yeah. The strength was the network. I knew that we had the votes. I mean, you go back to the poll, when it says 57%, right. you know, I mean, even that, yeah. much less your sense, right? So yeah. the number one thing with this issue was that there's no real, one of the advantages you have when there's no real persuasion is that I already know that people are either a yes or a no on this. Yeah. There's only 5% of the populace, you know, undecided. that might be undecided. So we don't even need to worry about them. What we need to do is make sure that all our people know that this is the vote on this day, that yeah. this is being voted on this day. And that's why the yard signs. So we went at this two ways, with two ways, social media and field. And what we did was, and again, like you said earlier, y'all were a lot more organized in Tulsa, but there was no really organizational well, strength here. Well, fortunately, I've been doing that for over a decade and was crushing turnout records down here. So. What that looked like and the way we did it was we literally lit bombed <laughs> like every door in Oklahoma, like 35% of the doors in Oklahoma County had literature the last two weeks saying, this is the day. The yard signs, this we're is the day, work. right? Now, so what we were doing there, though, is we were making sure that we were all talking yeah, and that everyone was talking and what I did was to counter what we knew, the reefer madness we knew. You know, they already put their talking points out three months earlier, so you could see what they were going to say. And what we did was we did the work, we did the research, we started really working to earn media, dropping press releases out to counter their message 
and say, hey, they're saying this, this is ridiculous, here's why, and started that barrage about 45 days out. So by the time that their ads started running, even the news outlets already had the evidence that they were full of shit. There was one that was hilarious where there was Trinidad, Colorado. <laughs> right. There was there was one there was one time, I think it was on Fox, uh, Fox twenty five here, where there was a no uh, there uh, there was a uh, a no ad was run, you know, during the broadcast, and then the segment comes back and there's a literal report on okay, yes campaign saying this, no campaign saying that they're saying this, but it's total bullshit and here's why. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then the ad runs again. So we literally, you know, we literally basically managed to counter about a million dollars worth of ad buy with a million dollars worth of earned media, which is again just us out there spreading the truth, people, you know, yeah. people, you know, speaking up. Were you surprised were you surprised when the and again, the, you know, the we'll say the deep state and Oklahoma has done a lot to wreck this, which we're going to talk to a lot more about in a second. But were you surprised that um, that the ballot itself, that 788, was on its own piece of paper? Well, that was that was really interesting because, I mean, again, it goes back to, uh, uh, and this is what it points to. I mean, this ultimately was the most successful grassroots operation in state history. Yeah, maybe ever in the nation. It was, it, it, it's possible because this was volunteers that got it, you know, got it on the ballot the first time that's ever happened in the state. Right. And then it was just an all, it was the biggest grassroots flex, at least in Oklahoma history. Yeah. You know, and so, um, uh, and and to that, to that, you know, there are a ton, a ton of people. You know, we've especially with seven eighty eight. Yeah. That you know, we've kind of talked about. You know, here are kind of some of the leaderships, but I mean, we're you know, there are so many people. You know, and again, you know, when you talk about what really fueled this, yeah, and you can't. This was seven eighty eight was not an industry fueled thing. This was not true leave in Florida dropping was, sixty million dollars trying to get wrecked. This was people that believed, and this was people that were here for a real thing, like uh, like the Warrior family. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, Jackie Warrior, you know, yeah. as you know those stories, Chelsea you know, Kennedy, you Chelsea mean. Kennedy, yeah. Nikki Weed, I mean, uh, you know, it, right, yeah. Ron, you know, one of the things, and I mean, that was another thing is on the campaign, something that uh, uh, Frank Sean Jenkins, Sean you Jones, know, yeah. had helped to yeah. organize was uh, did a bunch of video of people telling their personal stories. We're and talking was, about Cody, who was a vet. Yeah. Tiffany suffered with MS. You know, Sean. Uh, you know, kids, you know, epileptic problems, you Ray know, Jennings. Ray Jennings, you yeah. know, cancer. Yeah. And we, and, and God, I can't say how much I appreciate those individuals who hopped out and told those stories. And we, part of what we did, and this is again where it's kind of bringing the coalition together was we got, you know, they did that video. We got that sharing these four different personal stories. Yep. And about four weeks left in the campaign, we got those dropped down to 30 second clips. Yeah. And I put those out in a press release to all of the outlets. And, you know, part of it was A, to get it out there to the degree we had. The other part was a pump fake that we might actually go up on TV with this. Yeah. yeah. And and the underlying theme of this. And we didn't have any money for TV. Uh, of course we did. But we had social media. Yeah. We had a killer, we had killer social media. And this was one of the first things where it really showed that social media and out in the field is going to overcome TV, you know. So, but we put it out there. It was interesting. Was that actually baited an editorial response from the Oklahoman talking about, well, this is really bizarre. I mean, they could, because the message was clear. If you're against people having access to medical marijuana, you're an asshole. Yeah. That was that it. Was it. Yeah. That was it. That was the message. And it triggered them, which then I wound up, it was a whole last war in the press, right? You know? oh. And I mean, I wound up putting a press release out shaming the Oklahoman and calling out their colleagues to set them straight. And that's what really touched it off. Yeah. And it was, it was something else. But again, there are so many people, you know, Ronnie, Joshua, you know, there's so many people that are the ones who, 
I mean, at the end of the day, it's the strength of the grassroots. Yes. Yeah. All the shoots from the grassroots, and it's the people that have the passion. You know, any of y'all that are watching, thank you so much. If because you set a booth, if you got one signature, if you got out and voted, if you did anything, you know, good Lord, this happened with all, even if you just, you know, thought in your mind, this is a good thing to do. Hell, You're even if you just showed up to vote, Yeah. thank you. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's the thing, and that's, you know, and that's still real, and that's still there, well, you know? Yeah, we'll talk about kind of some of how this lingers into existing politics in, in a little bit, because it's, we've just had some really interesting things happen here in our primary right. elections in right. Oklahoma that are an extension of really this grassroots that we built, and this grassroots that wants to get things right here in Oklahoma, doesn't want a bunch of crap anymore, you know, we're tired of crap. Um, but anyway, so we passed the law. It's the greatest thing in the world. I've never been so excited about anything in my life. It was just the most amazing moment for me. And then within 30 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds, <coughs> they tried to screw it all up. Yeah, it did not take. I mean, the first thing is, is that the establishment here in the state truly did not believe this was going to pass. Correct. And, you know, then we just smoked. Yeah. And then it passed. And all of a sudden, and I mean, that's the thing, is that there were efforts ongoing through the spring to, hey, you know, our position is we're going to pass this. You guys need to be ready for it. Because, again, you know, 788 was five pages. And while we are minimalists ourselves on laws and regulations, there's no way to have a industry of this size without further Regulation. regulatory structure, right? Statutes. And so we're trying to work with them on that. And I mean, there was some, you know, there was some movement there, but they didn't take it seriously. They actually left session three weeks we, early that year. We were not, we were, you guys really wanted a special session. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't want a special session. I, I wanted, and again, that was naive and stupid now looking back because we needed freaking standards and we needed regulations. But mm -hmm. we were kind of opposed, let's say, to that special session. But it, that was, once we got on the same page, which took kind of through the end of the summer, but once we got on the same page, then things have, you know, it's been useful. Let's just say. Well, yeah, and that's the and that's the thing is that that's one of the things is so that so we managed to you know get the coalition together. Everyone generally rowing in the same direction. Some of course internal kerfuffles here and there, you know, yeah. but we achieved the goal. Bearded canvas. We pass it. Yeah, yeah. So um, so we get that done, and then like you said, it doesn't take, but it doesn't take, but like less than a week. And the state has already moved illegally to attempt to shut the program down through the Ooh. Board of Health. Licensed pharmacists. Like, I mean, the corruption came instantaneously. And so, now the good news is, however, is that apparently they didn't get the memo from a week before. And when they did that, I mean, all hell broke loose. <laughs> All hell broke loose, and you, you never have the state attorney general get involved in things like this. There is, <laughs> I, I tell you right now, there is literally a feature length movie that can be made from what occurred, you know, the following ninety days. You know? <laughs> yeah. And so it, it, there really is, and so the uh, uh, you know the thing is though is that yeah, so that's when we started to see uh, so that so the goal was accomplished. And then you've got division on, you know, should we go into, you know, do we need to go into special session to do this? Again, we had a 60-day enactment clause. And again, this is what caught them so off guard was it was the oh shit moment for the state where they thought strategically that putting it in the primary would defeat it. Defeat it. Yeah. And so then once it succeeded, they were looking at, okay, this is June, like we're issuing licenses by September 10th. And they did. <laughs> and they were wholly not prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And so, but that was, you know, if they would have put it on the November ballot, they yeah. would have been able to go into regular session, session and work, you know, yeah. and that would have been. So the, um, the uh, uh, so, you know, we had, you know, division shortly after, even though we're fighting against it, you know, some division, but we ultimately through the working groups that we were, again, uh, able, 
been able to get uh, the first ever in state history bicameral bipartisan working groups to actually work on this yeah. again it was functional for the establishment at the time because they had a lot of runoffs going just like we do now yeah okay <laughs> and it's very very similar this year to what we saw that year and in some so, places we don't have runoffs <laughs> right in some places that's already been settled um, but they uh, uh, so they got the working groups together, and we were ultimately able to kind of reform and, you know, come to a generalized consensus, about 80% consensus on what that regulatory structure could look like. We proposed that. They ultimately decided not to go into special session, and um, so September 10th, Licenses started, you know, being applied for, and you know, by late September, you know, we're, and, and, and we're of off the, and rolling. One of the things, would you agree with this? And again, this is just my sort of observation on what happened. But when we so they, you know, we passed a law that they never thought that we would pass. They tried to restrict us basically out of what we passed, which mm -hmm. we beat them back on. At that point, I think they, the deep state or whoever you want to call them, just sort of gave up. And once our program rolled out, it was two years, at least, before we had our first inspection. Um, everybody who applied for a license got one. Uh, there was no discernment. There was no discrimination. There was no inspection. There was no nothing. It basically, we, it was a blank check licensing for two years. Well, and that was one of the, you know, one of the points that, um, you know, that, that I know I worked, you know, to make abundantly clear to the powers that be in the states. I mean, again, I've worked with a lot of these folks. I mean, I've got, you know, generally got relationships. I mean, I can fight you on three things and work with you on five things at the same time. It's a nature of, you know, politics, politics right? And uh, so, um, but the thing is, is that the state was told at the time, you know, you have this option to go into special session or this place will be wall-to-wall -wall weed in a year. Yeah. Now, again, someone coming from the legacy works for me. Yeah. I'm here to free the weed. Yeah. But professionally, I'm going to give an accurate assessment of here's what you're looking at. Here are the decisions. Here are the ramifications, the cause effect of your policy decisions now. And here's what that's going to look like down the road. You guys make the choice. I'm not telling you what to do. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what the hell's going to happen. Yeah. And you can do with it what you want to do, right? Yeah. I've got my preference, and again, it's wall to wall weed. Now, so, <laughs> it, it, but I'm going to tell you all that's what's going. You got the option. You know, here's what this could look like, right? So, the thing is, is that what we saw is the state, and again, we have to we have to acknowledge that there was a handoff of governorship that year. Yeah. So the. Uh, our current governor, who in a lot of ways was propelled to the governorship yeah. by state question 788. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not that he was a pro marijuana guy or anything, but the absolute chaos of doubled voter turnout in a primary where he won by two, that got into second place by 2,000 votes. Barely. Yeah. Yeah. It, and you know, got it, him in a runoff. Right. Right. So, you know. Anyway, it was not on his, you know, I mean, why well, was one from Tulsa? Right. One, yeah. it, but the thing is, you can't imagine that with all the different things that are on a governor's agenda, that this would be, you know, the top priority. And so, you know, licensing took off, so on and so forth. And then, um, you know, folks already kind of knew what was going on. You know, we worked on the bill in the fall. It got greatly reduced from unity <laughs> To skinnity. <laughs> to skinnity. And like things like, well, and the thing is, is that the ramifications of this are being felt today. You know, a lot of folks are dealing with uh, what is known as the COO debacle uh, that has, you know, been brought on as an enforcement tool. You know, they were told that needed to be done before licenses went into effect. Yeah. Where we get the point where you've got licenses, if you want to come back and do this, you can't take their business because you already put them in business yeah. under those circumstances. So the ramifications of all of that are still today. Well, you know? the two interesting kind of minor ramifications, but, I, you know, we're sitting around talking with a group of lawmakers. You likely mm -hmm. were there. We're talking about smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. So where's it going to be legal to smoke marijuana? And one of the lawmakers says, well, it's just tied to public smoking law. Which is the would be 
the most liberal smoking marijuana allowance in the country. Um, and the activists that were standing there, including me, silently were doing backflips, you know, in our heads, and, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, that might be a bad idea. Yeah, that, that was, was idea. yeah, that was the that was the recommendation. I was like, well, let's keep it simple right now. Just what 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 can we do with cigarettes? Okay, that's cool, you know. But then the then the taxation one was one that went the other way. Oh, because it very yeah. again. I wrote the word, 7% tax, and so mm -hmm. and I knew what that meant, I knew what I intended, I knew what we thought we were intending when we put that forth, and yet we had them come on and tack on state tax and local tax on top of that, which was not the intent. But that was, it happened in the same way, so we're just standing around having to, yeah, well, this is what we're going to do, and not being able to defend it, just in the same way they couldn't defend public smoking. Well, and I mean, it's one of those things where it's like on the, on the tax rate, on the tax rate, right? It's like, you know, you go in, you're thinking, okay, you know, we put this tax rate on it, and then the state comes back and says, you know, like, all right, it's medical, we don't pay, you know, tax on our prescriptions, you yeah. know? And so the state comes in and drops, oh, yeah, but we're going to drop this on top of it, which is why we have functionally one of the highest rates of tax on medical marijuana in the in the country, but um, but so yeah, we uh, uh, you know we get into 2019. It was already kind of writing was on the wall. We had the coalition together. I mean, we were doing as far as getting policy passed and through the Capitol. Like, I mean, it was an epic lift just to get a coalition together around a general concept of unity. You know, get that and even get the skinny version of that through right yeah. and so um again but what was interesting is like the budget is the plan right and you know the first year budget allocation to handle oma is a sub subsection of health the department of health yeah i think they gave them about like three million dollars to work with in other words, there was no commitment. You know, it's almost like once they started letting licenses out in 2018, they just gave up. Yeah. And just said, let's, and, 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 but the reality is, the reality is, is that by the end of 2018, 2019, the whole state, it doesn't matter the people that were for it, against it. There's a whole lot of money that was against it. I mean, for example, Bank First. Yeah. Okay? Bank First against it. Who's the only bank that you can actually remit your tax to collections from a dispensary <laughs> to Bank First? So they're in on the action, you know? Yeah. A lot of the oil and gas and different folks, a lot of these people, all of a sudden, it became real, license was roulette, and... It's a green rush. Oklahoma City Everyone Chamber. loses their damn mind. Oklahoma City Chamber is always an interesting organization, aren't they? It, uh, yeah, it, it really is. I mean, well, it was interesting that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, your tribe, the Chickasaw, dropped yeah, 250K against, against it. You know? Against it, yeah. And uh, again, that again goes to the strength of grassroots and any of the other grassroots organizations out here. You know, something that uh, uh, we want to note, and again, we've seen a little bit of that, but... Our grassroots organization went up against the entire everything, the entire power structure, the man, whatever. They were all there against this. It didn't matter. Farm Bureau, the Barnyard folks, the Chamber of Commerce, oh, Oil and Gas, State Medical <laughs> Association, literally everyone. And we crushed them. We crushed them. Yeah, exactly. So the... Um, and you know, the thing perhaps, perhaps still. Well, and the thing is, so it's like we got into this like green rush mentality, and then I mean, we've seen, and I, you know, for the purposes of this, I really don't want to, you know, go through and just dissect who did what, you know, how we got allowed, but I will, I will just say one thing. I will say one thing. The way that this program was rolled out after we passed it. The way that licensing was handled, um, that was wholly, wholly, you know, the government's decision. Yes, yes. And that was not on us. This. We, nope. number one, the, you know, one of the things, keep in mind, you know, this is another thing. The entire, the entire point that the, uh, the, the, the entire foundation of what the majority of law enforcement efforts 
that we have seen, especially coming out of Bureau of Narcotics since about 20, late, 19, late 2019, early 2020, right, yeah. the entire foundation of those law enforcement efforts fundamentally rests not on any pre-existing law, not on anything that was done by lawmakers, but on core language of 788, and yep. that's the 7525 the rule. Yep. 788 itself always had provided the mechanism for the state to responsibly license people. Right. You know, and so, you know, I see the narrative now kind of going away from throwing us under the bus yeah. so much, and... But it was definitely pointed that way. Was oh, like, we fought that. We these, fought after them. That is only a recent term. Yeah, that, that is, is only the recent last you know few months. It's so. been all the you know dispensaries on every corner of Main Street are our all, all our fault. Chinese coming in and are all our fault, right? And that and that's the furthest thing from the truth. Again, mm -hmm. five page law. That's what we're <laughs> well, then that's it. Well, again, I mean that goes to you know that goes to some of the strengths of it though. Yeah, is that you know. It's our fundamental, it's the fundamental law that, you know, uh, that, you know, is even being used now. And I mean, and we all know if the feds were to push, you know, schedule three, hope they don't, deschedule, hope they do type of a deal. Yeah. That 7525 rule goes down in flames. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to have it federally legal for that to happen. Right. You know, in the meantime, that protection was there to give Oklahomans a jump start. Yeah. And not have every Californian and Colorado. And right, we knew they were going to come because we knew that their program sucked and ours didn't. Yeah, and so we've had that. We've had a lot of we've had a lot of cool people. And we've had a lot of you know assets. A lot of assets coming out <laughs> here too. You know, I mean, again, and again, this is one of the most entertaining. Again, myself, you know, long time in the legacy, been growing weed a long time, right? Yeah. You know, having folks from other states come out, and we're a flyover state, no one pays attention, but come out and. Oh, you, you know, we're going to teach you the ways of how to, oh, oh really, you are now. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, all right, guys, a bunch of master growers. We got flooded with master growers, guys. You know, it's like, whatever, dude. So, uh, yeah, but it's a, it's really, it's really, really interesting. Well, you would, you, would you say, so, let's kind of, let's, uh, I don't know, even what inflection points to hit past passing of the law. So, we we've, we've Tried to establish some trade organizations that um, are needed, but the trade organizations that are needed, I would say, and without you know any criticism to what's out there, they need to be we the people. I mean, we need to have kind of we the people trade organizations and not real you know self interest kind of focused. And it's the ones that have started that way. It's hard to change them, I guess. Um, well, and, and you know, just to, just to throw them out there, so we basically got. Uh, we've basically got a couple right now. Now, yeah. obviously, you know, and, you know, appreciate, you know, you being a part of it and all those that are a part of uh, our organization, which is ORCA, right. Oklahoma's for Responsible Cannabis Action. But we're not, it, there are, I don't like to identify as a, trade as a trade organization. Now, we perform basically a lot of those functions and then some. Yeah. Um, but we are also, uh, well, we're hardcore. In our politics, you yeah. know, we do not. I mean, we are. I mean, at the end of the day, we're ruthless. Yeah. And so, you know, you can't expect, you know, your standard issue trade organizations. There's, there's another thing too. They have to get along with it. Well, well, and here's the deal. Well, here's the deal. That's and well, and that's what that's one of the things about working. I mean, you know, you're a core part of it, but you know that um, uh, that it basically to this point, a lot of the operations that we do. That it greatly, it's a bit great benefit to me as the director to not have to run shit by a board. Yeah, you know, like I'm trusted to just make the right decisions in a lot of ways. Yeah, and so what that does is that gives us in a supreme amount of adaptability. And when, especially at the capital, you got things that are happening, and there has to be, there is not time when you're dealing with legislation. And we saw a lot of that this year, and had a lot more success this year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, um, uh, but 
you've got to remain adaptable, and it's understandable why organizations are set up, you know, you clear it with the members, this, that, and the other. I'm running off a pulse, right? So the other folks, you know, you've got, you know, you've got the Cannabis Industry Association, which, right. you know, I that was had birthed out of New Health and Solutions. So I, right. right, I helped found that thing, and yep. then, you know, one of the reasons that I, you know, initially went a different direction is because I had difference of opinion with, you know, Bud, over kind of what the direction of this was, you yeah, know? Yeah. And uh, now, Bud's not there anymore. Uh, Mike, uh, Kaylin, who I actually yeah, hired uh, into that organization yeah. early on, is, you know, they're there, they're doing it. They got a lot of cool members. We've got crossover, yeah. you know, within some of our membership and some of theirs. Yeah. Uh, they were really good. Mike, you know, they were good to work with this legislative session where, you know, it's instead of just having one, you know, we were able to reach out early and said, hey, guys, okay, here we go again. Here's what I'm seeing. Here's what generally we're thinking. Um, just know, because I like to establish this right out the gate, here are our red lines. Yeah. You already know what's going to happen if those get crossed. So are yeah. y'all, no, okay, no red lines. Okay, good. So what we can do to work together. And then there's a, you know, a reason. Would, would you say that work kind of represents if we had to capture that we the people voice and put it in an organization, would you say that Orca kind of captures that as best as anything that's out? I would. No, it absolutely it absolutely does because one of the things that uh, one of the things that again we're very very tied in, always been real you know real grassroots. You know, it's like we're you know advocacy is kind of like the middle ground between activism and law. Yeah. And so, but we are, because fundamentally, you know, uh, our goal is cannabis freedom. Right. And we are, you know, uh, short, short of morally reprehensible, you know, <laughs> all tactics are on the table, right? Yeah. You know, so, uh, because we do, I mean, I mean, I, you know, I'm a person of faith, so we're going to operate that way. You Absolutely. know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's just what it is. So, yeah. um, but that's really where it is. But I'm really glad, you know, be it work OCIA or another one that's popped up the last year or so, PCA, you know, know enough folks over there were able to communicate, able to be on the same page and do that. And just like Unity, that's good enough. Yeah. We don't have to have a big, you know, and, and, and again, a lot of times it's good to have multiple groups when that are generally on the same page because, you know, the way that I may communicate something is going to be different than the way one of those groups communicates something. You know, there are different relationships with different, you know, folks in government, and sometimes it helps anyone to hear something said a few different ways, yeah. and then it kind of clicks for them, and they get it, and they're able to make those decisions. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, again, you know, we stay really, really rooted again to what the people want. You know, we are, um, you know, we are the anti-big farmer. You know, we are the ones that are going to say there is a point where, guys, I know that there are folks in some of the trades, there are folks in the industry that want to be one of five people in the industry. Right. And while we agree with them on 90% of everything, right. you know, yeah. we don't agree with that. And, I mean, that can be just enough to keep us from really communicating effectively with some of those quote unquote bigger players. Yeah. You know? But but yet we may need those people. But we other but again things. we can pass notes amongst yeah. you know and, and generally get where we need to go and not let that be a hang up even if we are one hundred percent dedicated to making sure that we've got a lot of small operators in this state. You you made the analogy to the teachers and I think that that's you know although we don't have a union but it but the teach yeah <laughs> but the teachers have a lot of small groups that when they really want to do something and they want to you know get together they'll all pull together and they'll all row the boat in the same direction I would say we have we same. actually do a better job than they do of that yeah um, I, within yeah. their groups but yeah that's the but yeah that's the thing. You might talk about how um, we found common cause with other, uh, as Orca, um, and not that this is more about the history of 788, but it, it, this is important because this is how we will affect change in the future. And so, you know, there's no problem, you know, letting this out of the bag, so to speak, but um, we were very successful in this primary election mm -hmm. at 
targeting some races of some anti-cannabis uh, senators. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and we can. Yeah, let's 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 talk. Yeah, let's let's get into that a little bit. Um, the uh, and and we'll actually start with a little bit of 788 history. Okay. So in in twenty in twenty eighteen as uh, in twenty eighteen as we were building up to the vote. Um, again, I've referenced that there was some talk at the Capitol, you know, maybe, you know, might be able to, you know, get some laws ready. But we had a senator in, uh, we had a, we had a, a state senator, uh, Irwin Yen, uh, anesthesiologist, Oklahoma State Medical Association, which, uh, uh, I mean, we just, well, we just have to be open about it. The state medical associations are number one off in the state, even though the National Medical Association says that you should be able to utilize cannabis. Anyway. Um, anyway, so there was a, a, a senator, Irwin Yen, that wanted to, that was working to run legislation that would have had five conditions that, you know, which basically all of them had you a week from death before you could access uh, medical marijuana and uh, really actively push that. Well, so push to uh, the point where it well, was got well, the committee. Well, and the thing is, and that's what's really interesting about these state medical association backed. Uh, candidates is that they tend to piss off a lot of people. So um, Erwin Yin was also pushing. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you, Sonny. Oh, thank you. Um, what yeah. <laughs> was really interesting is that uh, so 2018 Erwin Yin. It was interesting because again, I've you know been doing campaigns, but a uh, um, a, uh, uh, a a new grassroots group sprung up in kind of in response and I think they've been around a little bit before that but a, a group popped onto the scene in 2018 Oklahomans for Health and Parental Rights and they were getting after the teachers. Uh, they were getting after Yen uh, uh, for some of his uh, uh, you know big pharma type you know uh, deals you yeah. know uh, 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 vaccine mandates that, yeah. that state right yeah. and so um, he had also managed to somehow piss off oil and gas. I don't know how he did that, honestly. But he had also was uh, 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 getting under the skin of our Second Amendment Association, the OK2A. <laughs> yeah, that's which, right. which in Oklahoma, y'all y'all know this. In Oklahoma, um, and this is really interesting about Oklahoma, is that you've got national organizations, but a lot of times, like, we don't listen to them. We listen to local, right? So. The, the Second Amendment, uh, Oklahoma Second Amendment Association, a guy named Don Spencer over there, been doing this a long time. You know, in Oklahoma campaigns, Oklahoma voters are listening to OK2A. They could give two shits less what the NRA has to say because yeah, they know who's really advocating here locally. It's a really interesting dynamic uh, uh, that they've got over there. But uh, so this other, this, uh, this group, uh, uh, Oklahomans for Health and Parental Rights. Uh, pops up, uh, uh, Liza Grady over there. Yep. And I'll tell you right now, Liza's fierce. Liza. So in 2018, I, I, uh, uh, I'd seen what they were doing and I reached out and I said, Hey guys. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it's about a month left in the campaign and I hopped out there and then, so I reached out and I said, Hey, uh, 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 Hey guys, what do you, you know, what do you got going over there? Like we're, we're down. Like we were, and there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a one hour podcast just on this, you know, what that looked like. But we'll just leave it alone and say, we reached out to them and we had common cause to get rid of Erwin Yen. Ultimately, Erwin Yen loses his primary only get, as an income, at only getting about 40% of the vote. It was the first time that I, had, this is the first time because when we were, you know, cannabis was almost new as an interest group, you yeah. know. But we got together with other grassroots organizations and really, you know, just kind of worked off of what each other were doing and talked, and we got rid of Irwin Yen. So fast forward to and that. Believe me, that was legend in the state capitol. Everybody knew. Everybody knew that he had been targeted very publicly and taken out. <laughs> right, and so things kind of come back around again this year to where. Uh, you know, folks that have been giving us a hard time at the Capitol, looking to scale back the program, looking to cancel cannabis events, create limiting conditions, um, limit patient access to medicine, much less uh, successfully pass 
a 2,000% tax increase on our businesses. It was nothing more than state revenue, House Bill 2179. We're in court on that, still working to strike that down. But the author of that bill, Senator Jessica Garvin, a lot of parallels to Irwin Yen. You know, she managed to piss off the Second Amendment folks. She, you know, managed to piss off uh, uh, Oklahomans for health and parental rights. It's and not a, not a, you go talk to her in her office, it's not a pleasant well, he, well, I mean, you didn't really get anywhere. Now, I mean, yeah. I, you know, personally, you know, Jessica, Jessica Gardner really is a really gregarious person. You know, she is not hard to get along with person to person. For me. <laughs> so hard to for me. Off of something. Yeah, 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 yeah. She got along with a lot of people. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but <laughs> policy-wise, I mean, it's just button heads. And when you're going to butt heads on policy, it gets handled in elections, right? So, um, anyway, she was one that had, she had run 21 bills at us the last two years. Again, massive tax increase, everything that's not conservative. Right. Right. And against cannabis freedom. There were two or three bills she had that was like, yeah, I mean, that's okay. But F minus, right? And so... Again, that's one of the things that we have to watch out for in what we do because we're still a hot topic. You see what's been in the press. I've been drugged down. I mean, like, open endorsements are not necessarily where we are right now. Yeah. And because it's not, again, tactically in campaigns, it's not the best thing to be. The best thing that we are is where we play to our strengths, and that is we're there. We talk to each other. We're we get our people to show up to vote. We bring the flame. You know, we can, yeah. we can, we have the ability to bring that extra several hundred voters out, right? So that is what we saw this year, and that actually went beyond. It bled over into, uh, uh, obviously, uh, the Senate, uh, Senator McCourtney, Greg McCourtney, who, um, uh, you know, was part of the working group. He was the author of this Kennedy bill. Um, again, really, you know, aligned in there with the State Medical Association. And while, you know, over the last couple of years, again, I call the balls and strikes as they are, but, you yeah. know, I think, uh, uh, you know, over the last couple of years that McCourtney had kind of got the message from us. Like, he was not voting on cannabis bills one way or the other. Right. Um, but there was just a lot of residue. Yeah. You know, and so... That again is one where um, that again is one where uh, uh, again we, we saw this, and I mean, and the thing is, is that do you think that we um, that, and just you know I think we did, but the Casey Murdoch race, I think we helped that race. Yeah, well, I mean, we uh, you know uh, a lot of our folks are out in northwestern Oklahoma. They definitely were on Murdoch's Murdoch side, and see. This is one of the things that gets real interesting when you look at the uh, how coalitions come together and where they differ. So, like, we go into the primary with, like, 80 different races. Now, we do not always agree with other interest groups on their picks. You right. know, even though we're all a bunch of really freedom-minded folks, there are there is nuance to this, yeah. you know. Yeah. And there can be someone that can be solid on their issues and has been a pain in the ass or for ass. political purposes is uh, uh, a pain in our ass. Yeah. And uh, Senator Cody Rogers was one of those. Yeah. You know, the, uh, you know, a lot of folks, a lot of our grassroots friends, you know, lined up for him and we were not for him. Yeah. And I'm not going to go all off into the why, but we had plenty of cause to oppose him. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, so that one fell how it did. Now, um, so there's, so there is nuance in this, you know, and, uh, uh, there really is nuance in it. And, uh, we, uh, we have those that, uh, uh, sometimes we just don't agree and that's okay. We haven't, we haven't talked about this at all, but I just, you know, ask you the question because they're kind of where my head's at, but, um, we likely need to petition again, you know, we likely need to do a constitutional petition, <laughs> you know, what are your kind of thoughts on that? Well, our ultimate reality here is that Oklahoma, again, you know, there are a variety of reasons, you know, fundamentally cannabis freedom, fundamentally, you know, true rights protections against Department of 
DHS. Yeah. You know, locking in our Second Amendment rights. Yep. You know, uh, you know, which you know, we made a lot of progress on that. But there are fundamentally, you know, you know, fundamentally, there are there's cannabis freedom. And then the second thing is is that I, we now see, for example, the feds flopping around with you know it's trying to rescheduling to schedule three, <laughs> which will be. Outside of we might get some tax breaks, maybe opens up banking a little bit. Like the trade off is a total and complete snafu. Yeah, it will. It will not be good for a program that's built like Oklahoma. No, it's the benefit will be. You know, it benefits. Let's say people like me who have been researching um, into the system and understand the system and understand how to kind of make, let's say, drugs that are going to help people. Mm -hmm. that will affect the system so it's a nice thing that now we've got kind of a pathway that's not um, completely blocked let's mm -hmm. say by the you know deep state or medical associations and things like that so it's nice in that way but it, to think about oh I'm going to get my smokable flower paid for by insurance <laughs> so I'm going to get it the dispensary <laughs> that, ain't happening. that ain't happening you might get a shot you know at the hospital that has some cannabinoid in it that insurance pays for, but it, it's not like, you know, it's going to kind of be something that you have that you take home with you. Well, and I mean, like, and, and, and we know that it's going to take at least a year. We also know that the oh, DEA yeah. is not locked into doing this. No. They are This is not a lock by any stretch, you know. Um, the, the thing is, is that, the thing is, is that, number one, Schedule 3 should be zero consideration in a sense because you're waiting on the federal government. Right. Don't hold if you hold your breath waiting on the federal government, you're dead. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You will die. Yeah. So uh but what it really comes down to and it's like what you talked about earlier, states' rights issue. Oh yeah. Let's talk about this as a states' rights issue. Okay. Yeah. Fundamentally fundamentally, just like we have done, you know, with seven eighty eight, my position is this. If the people of Oklahoma decide that they want a constitutional right to access cannabis and don't want their constitutional rights violated when they do, yeah. then that is the prerogative of the people. And if the people decide to do that, then I would expect, demand, and hold accountable our elected officials to back that play up. Even if the feds come and say, oh, well, this, that, or the other, I expect our attorney general yeah. to defend the people of Oklahoma's Absolutely. decision. Yeah. I don't want to hear, well, it's Schedule 1, so I can't do this. I don't give a shit. Get yeah. creative. Yeah, yeah. No, you're this, right. is, this is a state's yeah. rights issue that we're willing to go to war over. So the, we will expect that. The fear, the fear with Schedule 3 is that the FDA is going to get involved and that they'll say, oh, well, all, all marijuana is a medicine now, so we're going to drag back all these state programs and then we're going to regulate marijuana. That can't happen. I mean, we it, again, that breaks states' rights. That breaks the United States Constitution. This state has voted on a marijuana program that our people demanded, want, deserve, and will get regardless of what the federal government does. Well, well, let's, well, let's get serious here. I mean, again, this is where, you know, this is where, you know, again, with Orca, we'll take openly hardball, hardline and positions, why do we have right? open to a and all that? Right. It's real simple. Mm -hmm. You know, here's my perspective on it is, okay, so we make the program the way we want in our constitution. Yeah. That binds our state officials. Right. To be on our side. side. Yep. Okay. I suggest that all other states do that as well, to yeah. the degree that they can. Advocates, activists, and other states do that as well. You know, Oklahoma's taken the lead. You know, with 788, we blew this open to a degree that no one else had done before. Absolutely. And I believe it's going to be that we're we may be the only state that can push that envelope again for the rest. Yeah. Uh, now that said. You know, my take on it is this. It's like, oh, okay, well, the feds don't like it. You know, we got recreational. They passed Schedule 3. You can pry my weed from my cold, dead hands. Exactly. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, we're going to go We're gonna go Charlton Heston with a gigantic cola bud, you know? It's, it, that's, and that's the, way, that's the way, you know, that's the way it should be. So, I mean, if you look at it, okay, 
FDA, try it. Yeah. You don't have the manpower. Look, weed is here, it has been here, it is going to be here. You know, it was our medicine before they took it and gave us drugs. You know, this plant cannabis built America. This is America's crop. You are not taking this away from us at this point. I don't give a shit what the D.C. deep state has to say. You literally don't have the manpower to enforce it. So I was at the Association of Food and Drug Officials a few weeks ago, and it, I, I had the opportunity to sit down with the kid who is the FDA official who's over basically the FDA's positioning on CBD. CBD is a food. Has he even done anything in like six years? <laughs> like seriously, like CBD got descheduled, hemp was made legal, and FDA is like, well, Congress, you got to do something. Yeah, I mean, that's the exact same shit that would happen here. They just came out with all these, all this positioning on how dangerous it is, how much of a drug it is, and so I, I on I, CBD, yeah, and listen to this kid talk for, and you know, I was respectful. Again, I'm not going to argue with. Well, him yeah, I'm not trying to talk shit on some random like, like, Oh my god, it's just they're so far missing the boat, and they're so far off. From what we the people want and what we the people think, you know. So it's just, yeah. And again, thank God we have states' rights because that kid can never do anything here in Oklahoma. Well, and that's the that's the thing is yeah. that's where it's important to you know to diffuse to diffuse this and do this. Look, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the regulators are never going to keep up with the innovators. No. You know, yeah. when they are going at this, like when they say, we're going this from public safety, what they're doing is, like, if you are more focused on how does this harm you as opposed to how does this help you at this stage of the ballgame with, like, no recorded deaths ever from THC overdose, I mean, I think, what who was it, Willie Nelson said that the result of a THC overdose is a good night's sleep. Good night's sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, true. that's what we're dealing with here, and for these folks to say, oh, well, it could be risky in this... They're just defying gravity. I yeah. mean, at that point, they are on the talking points of the interest groups. Well, of, and it, it's, you know. it's, and, and it's good that, you know, you and I, I think, have, have had the same experience politically with this in that, and certainly with our state, like our federally elected state officials, meaning our state congresspeople and our state senators, that um, it's verboten to even bring this topic up. You can't even get the topic. There was a, a challenger for one of our U.S. Senators here in Oklahoma that Jed and I were supporting, and he was a medical marijuana advocate, and we could not even get his position paper in <laughs> national media, um, which was a big deal. He was a conservative Republican who supported medical marijuana, and no one wanted to talk to him about it. Mm -hmm. So it, we can't, it's, it's it, point being, we can't even start the discussion because the media won't help us with the discussion right now at the federal level, which is really interesting. Well, and that's, and that's again, that's where we've really adapted. We've really adapted. And again, that's where, you know, at a certain point, you just stop worrying about what the TV's doing. <laughs> you know, we talk person to person. We generate our own content on social media. We figure out how to break around the algorithms and do things like that. And we get the word out. Yep. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the folks that are, you know, that live in that fishbowl, they miss a lot of what we're doing. They never see it because they, well, again, we're really we're good. Busy, right. Yeah. And, and that's interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's been interesting. And, uh, 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 but we do have, and I do want to say this. We do have some folks on both sides of the aisle that uh, uh, that have been, you know, strong voices for us at the Capitol the last year. Yep. And it's really interesting. Just like you and Frank are on completely different sides of the political spectrum. It's like, what I like to say is like, we've got so far right and so far left that it makes a circle and now we're together on the deal. Mickey right? Mickey is, <laughs> Mickey, Mickey is, thank you, Representative Mickey Dollins, again, south side of Oklahoma City, yeah. uh, who, um, uh, who, I mean, he'll say something about it and has really, really been a great help over in the House. But then, you know, we see over in the Senate where your, you know, your, you know, your true conservatives, <laughs> right? You, you, but you, we see where folks like uh, who are on, over on the right side oh. of things. There, uh, uh, let's say uh, a newly elected guy, Dusty Devers, comes out of Lawton, oh. 
uh, we supported him over uh, uh, the OSMA, literally was sending in their number one 788 hater, yes. uh, Dr. Dr. Mean Gene, Gene. Dr. Mean Gene, Gene, Gene up there. But, you know. Near death Gene. Well, and this thing, and then like a, a, a guy, uh, 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 Shane Jeff, just got reelected out of Shawnee. He's only got two years left. He's going to serve that out, but he won a four way primary. Yeah. And, you know, there have been a lot of illegal grows that popped up in his area. And, uh, but, you know, it, you know, he's been really fair. And one of the, one of the, one of the best comments that was made this year, uh, during floor debate was, uh, Senator Jet hopping up and saying, look, fundamentally guys, I don't have to like an industry to like the constitution. Yeah. You know, you can't just cause we got those up there that, you know, we've been trying to literally target us specifically to remove those constitutional rights. Yeah. And so, you know, there, and we're getting more and more voices up there that are saying, okay, look, you know, where you're at in the program, you know, no one is here trying to have the Communist Party in the state of Oklahoma hiding out in our program. It's beyond our program. We did not bring them right. here. They come to a bunch of states, and they are, our program is one of the places they like to hide. Yeah, talk to you the know? University of Oklahoma about some of the programs they've instituted with uh, China. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. So... Sorry, not to go with it. <laughs> yeah. Just anyway, um, but yeah, no. I, I I guess to really kind of circle, you know, back around and probably, you know, I guess kind of, you know, work to wrap it. Um, yeah. Is that fundamentally uh, we need to the people need to step up and they need to you know we need to run uh, we need to put recreational access into the constitution uh, moving forward. Yeah. Now. The process was changed. If folks, uh, and this is something that, you know, I'm gonna get to work on, you know, we're gonna explore this, kind of get an exploratory committee launched here before long and spend a couple of months. But, you know, if we want to have a vote on recreational uh, in the 2026 cycle, we're way too late yeah. for uh, 2024. Yeah. But if we want it in the 2026 cycle, we actually need to start now and we need to most likely get paperwork filed with the state uh, September, October of this year at the latest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with That's you. just what it is. And if, you know, if you're in the industry or you're, you know, just somebody who wants to, to do this to, and we need to put the program in the, in the Oklahoma Constitution. We know enough now about the medical program that we can do that, and we feel pretty comfortable in that we're not going to, screw the state and, you know, stick something in there that can't be changed without a two-thirds, you know, vote of the vote chambers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we feel pretty good that we're in a position that we can do that. But, again, it's, we can't do this. In 2014, Cindy and I paid for the entire petitioning effort. So we wrote the check for that entire petitioning effort. Mm -hmm. In 2016, um, you know, other people did. Joe Gorman and his group, you know, sponsored a lot of that. Um, Frank, you know, generate a lot of money for that. But those were not, those were $40,000, $45,000, dollars $50,000 efforts. Right, right. I know, you know, what we did campaign-wise, if, uh, if you would have had a million dollars, you could have done a lot more than you were able to do with, you know, 150000 or 120000 mm -hmm. So we've never had any money in this movement, but yet we've been very successful. But in order to do the next petition effort, we can't, you know, Jed can't continue to do what he's doing for without pay and for on cash and you know my wife and I can't continue to do that without and not that anybody's looking for any pay but that the something needs to be properly sponsored in order to really do this right and again that's going to take some people who have some funds stepping up and saying that they want to do this. You know one you know one thing and this is what we're going to explore that was a. Uh, 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 I was actually uh, I was actually talking with a mutual friend yesterday about this. Okay. Um, and uh, they actually just got a dispensary open up around the corner here. So oh, okay. We'll visit on that in a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, one thing that uh, uh, one thing that's really kind of points to what we got done, some of the stuff we got done with the legislature this year, but the legislative efforts this year have now literally saved or are about to save this industry 
millions of dollars. Yeah. You know, undoing the, and this was a purely Orca pet project, was to get the employee credential system fixed. Yeah. And by doing that, we got that done. And that in and of itself saved us in $50 increments a half million dollars for the rest of this year. Yeah. Much less final form testing, you know. The thing is, and, and I was having this conversation yesterday, we've got about 25,000 people that have applied for employee credentials. It's basically 50 bucks a pop. Okay. Okay? Okay. Um, if you got rejected, you have to do it over again. Yeah. We eliminated that. Yeah. If employers, for example, one example, if employers said, okay, 50 bucks a head for every employee I got, that's what I'll donate to this. Yeah. We have the full budget we need to do in this. order to do this. Yeah. Our organization actually just saved everyone that money. Yeah. You know, and so that's what we're going to get into kind of with this an exploratory deal. And again, uh, you know, one of the things that unlike, you know, what was done with uh, 820 in a lot of ways, you know, one of the, what I can. You know, Let's talk about 820 real quick. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. it, 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 a lot of people think that. Um, you know, something ran in Oklahoma that the kind of marijuana people in Oklahoma did it, and, you know, you're kind of looking at the marijuana people in Oklahoma. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, let's let's talk about, let, let's talk about 820, and let's let's talk about why 820 was the wrong approach to Oklahoma. Yeah. You know, how do you go, yeah. how do you go from 788 winning, like, 35 counties to 820 winning zero counties? approach the wrong approach and this is why you know we have to do this you know what eight you know 820 made the same damn mistake that the establishment made in a lot of these primaries is thinking that you can come in you can throw money at something and you're going to overcome grassroots opposition yeah. you know that you can just walk in you know you know we're bringing this to you we're going to pay for it you know Acknowledge us, you know, like Ber Berkeley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Berkeley. Yeah, being it, you're not Xerxes, okay? You know, you're not the man god of, you know. And so that's the thing is that that's where it ran into trouble. And this is one thing is that you know when uh, you know we were very open about the fact that we were opposing it. I mean, I walked in and literally took them on pro se against the largest law firm in the state, and you know, roughed them up pretty bad there. So here's the thing. And this is why it's important, you know. Um, this is why it's important, you know. You one does not simply walk into Oklahoma and pass a marijuana law, you know. If you come in, it doesn't matter, you know. And again, it's 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 demonstrated in the primaries, you know. You cannot just come in here and buy an office. Yeah. You cannot just come in here and buy a program. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah. You know, and the, you know, you know, this where, you know, one place where I, you know, I was asked about this the other day, you know, governor said that, you know, governor Stitt said that, you know, if this vote was held today, it wouldn't pass. Well, that's delusional. Yeah. Okay. It's also delusional to believe that people will not pass recreational. You know, the reason that 820 failed is because the people of Oklahoma didn't want it. Exactly. You yeah. know, yeah. we knew better. Yeah. Than to, um, we knew better we than to see. vote a duplication of an already duplicated system upon ourselves. Anyone that's involved in the industry, you see the way that everything's gone with licensure registrations. A lot of y'all being behind a year, two years on those. Do you think that any of you would really actually have a license for recreational sales right now? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't. They would. It, again, it was a statutory measure. It would have gone in, they would have delayed implementation by at least three years, just like we saw in many other states. Yep. You know, so the reality is, is by defeating 820, if we follow through now on a good version, we will actually wind up having recreational sales before what we would have if we would have passed 820. I completely agree with you. And the other thing that we... It was yeah. a tough call to make. Believe me, guys, I didn't want to have to go out and oppose recreational in any form, way, shape, or form, but it is what it is, and it had to happen for the betterment of 
the state of Oklahoma. It would have completely screwed up 788. It would have wrecked our medical program. It was written from out of, you know, you and I know a lot about what happens right. and how it all happened, but it was right. written by out of state and, and all that. So it was a good thing. And, you know, thank you uh, to all you guys who have always really supported, you know, our efforts to try to do mm -hmm. what we think is right and, and be good shepherds, you know, of this industry, this plant, you know, this whole vibe. So yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we're just a couple of yahoos that aren't hard, to, that aren't scared to try. You know? Shepherds. We will <laughs> rush, we will rush the hill, you know, so, yeah. uh, and I think that, uh, again, I think we're kind of, we may be kind of entering a, a new era of, you know, the program. We could be, you know, on Starting to see a little more cooperation on the agencies, you know. The so you're working a lot with the agencies, and um, that, do you want to kind of mention that just a little bit about you know kind of the, you know both agencies fight each other in Oklahoma. Getting them to work together is difficult, and it takes usually someone bridging that. They're not real apt to. Uh, OBN is not going to pick up the phone and call. OMMA generally, so someone's gonna have to bridge that. Well, what I would what I would say is I would say that uh, that you know you can't assume that while the state of Oklahoma, the government is the state of Oklahoma. They all are the state. You know, they are a combined entity. Um, you you really do. I mean, you know, there can be breakdowns in communication. You know, yeah. the, the the thing is, is that you it's it gets real complicated real fast. I mean, they you know they definitely communicate well in some areas. In some areas, it's like you, you, you're like, where's where did the breakdown happen here? Why you know you know when you when you have things like software that's supposed to allow them to talk to each other more easily. I mean, sometimes they use, sometimes they don't. But you know, also you know you can't always expect even that. You know, agencies have their lane, and they don't always necessarily, you know, just like, you know, they don't necessarily get marijuana business operations completely. They don't always necessarily get their own rules, e each other's rules either. Yeah. I mean, they've got their lane. They stay in it. There can be consequences for them for getting out of their lane and getting into the other That's agency's true. business, you yeah. know. So, yeah, there is definitely, I, I would say this, there's definitely room for improvement. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, I think that goes for just about everyone and all things, you know, but there, there are definitely some things where, you know, there could be improvement. I appreciate any opportunity when I identify where some of those breakdowns are and try to, you know, pass some notes, you know, when they, when they do listen, I mean, sometimes they do and they get it and, you know, it works out and sometimes they keep on the path and then, you know, we find that that may have been a good, a good thing there. So I don't want to. I don't want to beat up on too much, <laughs> you know. But there's again, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of room for improvement. I do want to say this though. To be fair, to be really fair to the state agencies, is this: there is a lot of crap that gets assigned to them mm -hmm. that is more properly assigned to lawmakers. Mm -hmm. When you have a lawmaker pass a law that says, if you don't have this sign out front, you shall be revoked. When a lawmaker creates a law that will cancel your license, the most stringent, the, 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 the strongest punishment for any offense that a cannabis business can make right now is for not having a sign out front. Not selling to a minor, not selling out the back door. Those are like, oh, $2,500 fine or this. Automatic license revocation for a fucking sign not being out front of your grow, making you a target yeah. to criminals. Yeah. You know, that's the type of stuff. And so then, you know, people get called on that by the agency. And they're like, why is this so harsh? They're like, that's the law. We don't have a choice here. Yeah. So the agencies have had to mitigate a lot of crap bills from, from lawmakers. 2022 and 2023. The good news is some of the lawmakers, uh, some of the lawmakers, um, you know, Paxton, Lowe, Coleman, some of these guys this year came back and helped fix some of the stuff that needed to be fixed. Sure, sure. But that's one thing is that a lot of folks have to understand that's why we get so hard on the elections and so hard on the petitions is that a lot of the crap, you now the agencies, again, they are not blameless you know, they have room for improvement, but we have to also understand that 
there's a lot of crap that gets assigned on them. That fundamentally, it was a shit law to begin uh, with. Could you imagine t- you're taking Adria Berry's job at the you know point that she took it? So it's just um, you know. when Director Berry was hired, my first message to her was condolences. Yeah, <laughs> bye, run. You know, it was condolences. But you know, I, I su- you know I supported her at the time, and I still support what she's trying to do because she got. I mean, she just got handed an absolute uh, an absolute yes. debacle. Yes. You yeah. know. Well, things well, I wish she would like to see her do different, but again. Yeah, no, ditto. Yeah, it, it, there's things she could be more aggressive on if she's not being aggressive on. Um, okay, so is this a good place to leave it? I think it probably is. You know, I mean, you know, you and I, we could go on for forever, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, this has been great. I really appreciate you. Uh, yeah, we've been rocking steady two hours, so, but I really appreciate you, you yeah. know, doing this and, you this know. Good. Always good to see you, my friend. Yeah. Always good to see you. And uh, I don't know. We'll see what uh, folks have to say. Maybe I'll have to do some follow-up crap over there from the Orca platform. And, That'd and, be good. Yep. Lord, we'll see what we may have said that may have got us in trouble with someone. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Again, yeah. happy anniversary. Thank you, thank yes. you, thank you thank to you. everyone who is a strong advocate. Uh, uh, you know, I just want to give a shout-out. Daryl Carnes, love you, brother. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, someone that came in has been a huge advocate yeah. after 788. And it's don't want to, right? Don't want to. There's just so many people, and that's a great thing about a grassroots movement. It's a, it's a good problem to have. Is that we're going to piss someone off because we didn't mention someone. Yeah, you know, Shelly. You know, everyone. I really appreciate you guys. And uh, yeah, we'll get to work. And I don't know. Let's see what uh, we come together with here the next three months. Sounds good. All right. All right. All right. See, see you guys. guys.